It's a matter of history now. And what I'm glad about with the podcast, it's not in a book somewhere that's just going to sit in the library and nobody's going to read it. Those voices are up in the ether and they will remain there until the earth falls into the sun. So anybody going forward who wants to write something about the murder of Martin Luther King is going to have to deal with those people, those voices, those witnesses that we gathered there. You will not be able to go around it and not deal with it. Welcome to the Labor Solidarity Podcast, which is an Empathy Media Lab production highlighting the work of organizers, labor leaders, and great struggles in labor history. My name is Evan Papp, and I'm the executive producer of Empathy Media Lab, which publishes content on labor, political economy, art, and culture, and we're a proud member of the Labor Radio Podcast Network. Today, I'm speaking with Bill Kleber, who is the host of the MLK Tapes, a true crime podcast from Tenderfoot TV and iHeartMedia that explores never-before-heard details about what happened to King on the day of his death. With rare recordings of eyewitness testimonies and new interviews with people who are there to reveal the true story of the plot to kill Dr. King. Bill is also an author, part-time journalist, and co-host of the podcast The RFK Tapes. And he is co-author of Shadow Play, The Murder of Robert F. Kennedy, and author of the novel The Rebellion of Miss Lucy Ann Lovedell. Bill, thanks so much for your time. You bet. So I wanted to interview you for the Labor Solidarity podcast because King was in Memphis to organize the sanitation workers, and he was heading into the summer of 1968's Poor People's Campaign March on Washington, which was demanding an economic bill of rights, which I've been very interested in. And King was seeking to unite the trifecta of labor, civil rights, and anti-war. And I listened to the MLK tapes, and I was just blown away with how well it was put together and how well it just eviscerates the official narrative while providing a glimpse of the forces aligned against everything King stood for. But before we go into the MLK tapes, could you share with the audience a little bit about your background and how you got interested in producing this podcast? Well, I, I'm not an academic and I'm not really a particularly a researcher. I'm just a, just a person I live in upstate New York, but I did, gosh, in 19... 90, I got involved in the murder of Robert Kennedy. I heard that there was a group of people, the files in the RFK caves had been kept secret by the police. I should back up. But in 1968, Kennedy is murdered at the Ambassador Hotel and Sirhan Sirhan is caught gun in hand and he's a little spacey, doesn't seem to know why he's there, but eventually he says he did it. He offers a motive and says he acted alone. Slam dunk, right? Yeah, well, except that the police refused to open their files. And, you know, well, if it's Sirhan Sirhan acting alone, what, what are they, what's the big secret? And they just wouldn't do it. And for 20 years, they wouldn't open their files. And, and there were a lot of lawsuits and hearings in Los Angeles. And finally, the, the state opened the police archives. And I joined a group of people who started going through the finally opened police files. And it was a huge undertaking. It's massive files and lots of audio tapes. And uh, what became apparent was that uh, the police kept the file secret because it was a complete record, an unrelenting record of their, their crimes in the case of, of fabricating evidence, destroying evidence, and coercing witnesses. It was shocking. And uh, when you finally started looking at the evidence, it appears to have virtual certainty that two guns were firing in that pantry. And very, very likely that none of the bulls from Sirhan's gun ever struck Robert Kennedy. Well, this is amazing, you know, stuff to find 20 years after the, the, the case is over. At that point, as part of what I was doing with these people, I got in to talk to Sirhan Sirhan. And, I, you know, I found a very intelligent, responsive man who had been in jail his whole life, his whole adult life, for a crime he had no memory of committing. He was there. He had a gun. He was shooting. I just remember. And, you know, most people and myself included would say, well, you did it. You don't remember. I don't care. But when, when the evidence starts to show some other explanation for what's going on there, like a, a second gun shooting, you start, you have to ask yourself, why doesn't he remember? But in any case, Sir Hand couldn't really help us untangle many of the mysteries of this case because he really didn't know much. But this group of people put together a request to the grand jury in Los Angeles, asking the Los Angeles county grand jury to investigate the LABD for willful and corrupt misconduct in the murder, murder investigation of Robert Kennedy. And we thought we had it nailed. There was 800 pages of evidence, 800 pages 
detailing the LAPD's destructive evidence, falsification evidence, and coercion of witnesses. And we, we, this was an important event in American history. We provided the evidence and they did nothing. They did nothing. And uh, so in the meantime, I, I went to Vanity Fair with a magazine article I'd written, you know, incorporating my interview with Sir Han and this evidence we found. They were hot for it. They were all, oh, whoop de doo And so they bought the article, paid me in full, and then refused to run it, you know, and catch and kill. And I was caught <clears throat> uh, and I couldn't go anywhere else with it. So I went home very discouraged, and this is all leading up to the podcast, but not knowing what to do. But then I realized I had all these audio tapes that came out of the police files of them browbeating witnesses and forcing them to change their testimony. And I mean, audio tapes of all kinds of bizarre stuff, like putting Sertan under hypnosis in his jail cell, trying to get him to remember the crime. Reach for your gun, Sertan. Kennedy's coming, Sertan. Reach for your gun. You know, it's bizarre stuff. And even after all that, which was almost like a, a memory implant, Sir Han just uh, can't, can't recall the crime. So I put together a one hour public radio documentary using scotch tape and razor blades, which is how it was done back then. Okay. And playing all these audio tapes and interviewing some people who were there, like a couple of FBI guys who were there, who saw the evidence that proved that two guns were shooting evidence that the police took down, booked as evidence, brought to the police station. And then when no one was looking. They burned it. I mean, this is, this is why they kept their file a secret. And uh, I, we ran this uh, one hour radio documentary, got picked up the, by 160 public radio stations across the country. I didn't know there were 160 public radio stations in the country. It, it was, it was a, a minor big thing. And then, then Time Magazine ran a full page review of this little radio documentary that I put together. Favorable review. I don't know how that got snuck through, but, and then St. Martin's Press called me up and said, Hey, would you like to write a book? And I said, sure thing. So I wrote Shadow Play along with Professor Phil Melanson of the University of Massachusetts. And we went through the whole crime in Shadow Play and showed that absolutely positively two guys were shooting in the, the, the pantry and that very unlikely that Sir Han bullets struck Robert Kennedy. In any case, the New York Times refused to review the book. We were really careful. We didn't speculate. We were, you know, conspiracy that, that we were just, you know, people sometimes think I'm a conspiracy guy. I'm not, I'm an evidence guy. And this is what we did. The New York Times would not review the book. What the hell is that? You know? So anyway, but I did learn a lesson on the, uh, the power of hearing voices, that power of hearing the police browbeating these witnesses or threatening them. So when the 50th anniversary of these both King and Kennedy assassinations came around, you know, I was involved in a podcast called the RFK tapes, which took the name of my original radio documentary. But I came in contact with a man named Bill Pepper, who at that time I was interviewing him because at that time he was Sir Han's attorney. But I got to talking to him after hours and he had worked his whole life on the murder of Martin Luther King because he had been friends with King in the year before he was killed. Pepper had gone to, I hope I'm not, you can edit this. No, 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 please, I hope I'm not. Yeah, yeah, no, please keep going. But uh, Pepper had, had, as a young man, an extraordinary young man and a great athlete, baseball player, basketball, got an Ivy League education because he could throw a really great curveball and got sent to Cuba on some team and got to know Fidel Castro and hung out with Che Guevara. I mean, how many people do you know that hung out with Che Guevara? Incredible guy. And he sent himself to Vietnam. He got a, uh, he got a letter of introduction from the Cardinal Spellman and the guy who owned the, the Reader's Digest, two really, really conservative guys sat on the Vietnam, uh, having no idea what he was going to come back with. And he came back with these photographs of horribly burned children. It was just heartbreaking that by napalm and white phosphorus and, and basically war crimes that were being committed in our name. And no one was paying any attention to that at this time. There was all light at the end of the tunnel, the, the briefings, how many Viet Cong we had killed this week, la da da da. And Pepper went around the country, took all these photographs and came back. And no one would publish them, nobody. And finally he found Ramparts magazine and they agreed to publish these pictures. And Martin Luther King saw Bill's article 
and called the children of Vietnam and saw the pictures and said, I've got to meet this guy. And so a year before King came out against the war, he met with Bill Pepper and Pepper described it to me, he said, King started to weep when he was looking at these pictures. So that's how Bill Pepper got to know um, Martin Luther King. And he worked with King in the last year of his life. And um, when King was murdered, he just became distraught and discouraged. And he believed the official explanation, as most people did, as I did, everybody did, basically. They finally caught the guy and he said he did it. And he was said to be this giant racist, da 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 da. And so Bill Pepper believed that James O. Ray, acting out of hatred, had killed Martin Luther King. And then some years after the crime, he'd gone back to law school, gotten a law degree. And some years after the crime, he gets a phone call from Ralph Abernathy, who's King's number two. And Abernathy says to him, I, I want to go talk to this guy, Ray, because I'm just having a lot of bad feelings about all this. I, I don't think we're being told the truth here. So Pepper agrees to go to interview Ray in prison with Abernathy. And they, they go up to Brushy Mountain State Prison and they talk to him for five hours. And they come away with a feeling that this guy didn't shoot Martin Luther King. They don't know how all the pieces fit. But they come away with a definite feeling that Ray did not shoot King as he said he did. And so Pepper then devotes the next 40 years of his life investigating the murder of his friend, Martin Luther King. And once people start, started hearing that there was somebody investigating and asking questions yet with the police, people started coming forward and they'd come forward and tell Pepper what they knew what they saw, what they heard. And each time somebody came forward, Pepper sat them down and recorded them and put them under oath and recorded them. So those, those, they become affidavits in a way, you know, just as if it had been then spoken in court. Well, this went on for, for some number of years, but meanwhile, Pepper represented the King family in a lawsuit that concluded that King had been killed by a conspiracy and Coretta Scott King, King's widow held a press conference and, and got up and said, this guy, James O. Ray, was, was simply the guy set up to take the blame. This is from a very conservative, soft-spoken Christian woman. Finally got up and said, 30 years, 30 years after the crime that her husband had been killed by a conspiracy. So it, they made some headway, but not really. You know, it, this is all you know, taking place off in the shadows. But when I met with Pepper, he told me this story that I've just told you about how this all came about. And turns out he has scores and scores, over a hundred audio tapes of all these people and their stories. And, you know, and I'm going, I'm, I'm thinking again, back to the power of that, that documentary that I did in 1993. And I'm thinking people have to hear this stuff. And so I was, I said, Bill, you know, do you know what a podcast is? And no. Okay. Well, I don't either really, but this is, <laughs> this is what it is. And I got his permission to walk out the door with a duffel bag filled with all these audio tapes and permission to go down to the King Center Atlanta, where he had a whole another hundred of them store. And then, then to re digitize them and record them so they could be and then I called up Donald Albright of Tenderfoot TV and told him what I had and what I wanted to do. And, you know, he invited me to come down to Atlanta and they're a great company, by the way, Tenderfoot is just fabulous. A lot of really first rate podcasts up and up and vanished and to die, live and die in LA and, and oh, DC monster and just on and on. And I got turned down in a number of places where I, I approached podcast producers and I couldn't get anybody interested in this. And I ran it by them down in Atlanta and they said, let's go. And so then th that was all great. And they said, well, th this is good. We'll produce it and we'll back you up, but you'll write the whole thing and you'll narrate the whole thing. And which is what I wanted, but it, that great. Now I had, you know, 150 audio tapes to listen to and figure out how they would all fit together in a 12, 12 episode or 15 episode podcast. So. That's how it came about. Yeah, it's incredible. And it's such a historical presentation of the evidence on audio that 
people hundred years from now can listen to. And it's, it's just amazing. And I'm obviously encouraging everyone in the audience listening to this interview to listen to the full presentation of the MLK tapes, but just a little bit of a scene setter. So in 1993, HBO aired a mock trial of this, of this James Earl Ray with real attorneys and a jury. And Ray was found not guilty. I couldn't find the video, by the way. I looked in preparation for this interview. And then, as you said, in in 1999, another wrongful death lawsuit filed by the King family concluded that it was a result of conspiracy involving multiple groups. And yet, 23 later, 23 years later, after that, where there's still many people are just completely unaware of of all this evidence that's been presented. So it's so amazing that your team has been able to bring this back up with with you leading it. But if we could begin in Memphis, because I, I don't know exactly where we want to go with this, but it is, what is it, 14 interviews and one bonus episode. But in Memphis at that time, King was going down there to organize sanitation workers. And Memphis was just a cesspool of mafia and FBI intrigue. And uh, there's just so many contradictions and evidence and witnesses throughout that you present. And one of the things that I, I learned about was that King, whenever he went to Memphis, he had an all black eight person security team that accompanied him where, wherever he went. And they were reassigned on that fateful day. The FBI put out a press release to get him to criticize him for not staying in a black hotel and said he should stay in the Lorraine motel, which is very, you know, bizarre. And then there was the people running the Lorraine motel that King was initially placed in the bottom floor and then they asked him to go to the, the top floor. And, and then even James Earl Ray, he pled guilty based on this conspiracy charge of murdering Martin Luther King. And then three days later, he recanted his plea and never confessed to the crime. So these are just some of the things that you just lay out and just <laughs> hammer home that there is a lot of illegal criminality going on in our so-called justice system. Yeah, it was, I mean, all those things of him being maneuvered down to the Lorraine, and this was a document that came out of the FBI files. You know, when I talked to James Lawson, who was a friend of King's and Reverend Lawson, who was the guy who, who invited King to come to Memphis to, to help the sanitation workers. And Lawson was just, it was, he noticed the week before the murder, these articles started appearing. Why is King staying in white hotels? Why isn't he at the Lorraine? And it, he was wondering what, what the hell is that all about? And then it comes out after, after Hoover dies, you know, they start going through the FBI files and the original press release, you know, composed by the dirty tricks department of the FBI comes out where they composed this whole article and gave it to quote, friendly newspaper resources to embarrass King and basically forced him to go down to the place where an ambush awaited. And when I, when we talked to the, I didn't talk to him, with, but when we had the recording of uh, Jerry Smith, who was the captain, police captain, black police captain in Memphis, who was head of the security detail, who, who which was not called to guard him that, that time. And no reason was ever given. He said they would never have, if they were assigned, they would never have let him stay at the Lorraine, because of the access to the rooms outside, it just completely exposed. They said they, they like the Admiral Benbow or the Rivermont, which had, were hotels where you had access, interior access to the rooms they could guard at night, which they did. They guarded King day and night in these, these hotels, but they couldn't, they couldn't guard him well. They weren't even called, but they, they would not have let him stay at that hotel if they had a say in it. It, it was remarkable, but that, that little thing comes out of the FBI files. And so their fingerprints are on this thing. And, and the other thing is that, you know, there were two, two black firemen in the fire station across from Lorraine who were told the day before King was to be killed, that they had to go to, to other fire stations in the city that next day for no reason, just they had to be cleared out. There was a police detective, black police detective, Ed Reddit who was surveilling King's room from the back window of the firehouse, who was 
told to go home. An hour before King was murdered, he's taken off the job. And then there are a couple of guys with flashing army ID that were allowed to go up to the roof of the firehouse to photograph the Laredo Motel on just what happened to be the day that Martin Luther King was killed. Now, these things individually or even all together don't prove that there was a conspiracy. But if, there, if they were table setting for a murder, then the finger of guilt call points back to the people who could make these things happen. Who had the power to send Ed Red at home? Who had the power to tell the black security detail not to form for that day? And that's what these things tell you. They point the finger back at, at the people who had the ability to pull these things off. And who had the power to destroy the crime scene by cutting down the bushes? And, and who yeah. out of their right mind would think that James Earl Ray could fire a shot from this bathroom window in the Lorraine Motel? It, it's just absurd. I, could, you, could you talk a little bit about the supposed sniper's nest of James yeah. Earl Ray? You know, it, it, it's really great. The, the, the Civil Rights Museum is in Memphis, it, the National Civil Rights Museum that was built into the old Lorraine Motel. It, it's, a, it's a fabulous piece of work, and, and I encourage anybody to, to, to go down there, the history of slavery and the civil rights movement. It's, it's beautiful, it's done so well. And one of the things they did, I mean, there's there some years, they did support the official version of the crime. That's, that's changing and continues to change in this day. And I think the, the podcast, has had an influence on, on what is going to be the various position that they're going to be taking now. Incredible um, interview, by the way, at the very end of the person who works at the museum who just fire, it's, it's pure fire that everyone should listen Ryan to. Ryan Jones, he's just yeah. an, a historian there and they are, they, they are in the process of reviewing their, their, the various things that they have on display there and the position that they're taking on them now. And then that, that's important because supposedly at this point, they have a neutral stance. But it, it, it wasn't really, it wasn't yeah. really neutral. It, they were trying, but didn't get there. But to go back to your question, that the bathroom where Ray was supposed to have fired the fatal shot it, is preserved. They, they, what they did at the museum, when the building became available, they bought the building and they renovated the building so people could go in and out as part of the museum. And they kept the room that Ray rented in, in ex exact, you know, just, just the way it was that day. And the other room that they kept was the bathroom where supposedly the, the fatal shot was fired. And man, you stand outside, they have it glassed off and you look at that thing and you realize this would be an extremely difficult shot to make. And because it's, it's very narrow. There's a tiny little bathtub shoved up against the wall. And then there's this little window that's almost against the, the wall opposing it. And somehow you're supposed to be standing in this narrow tub in, in this little window and it's an angled shot and the butt of your rifle is going to be hitting. The, it's, it's like, it's not impossible, but it like, not like you don't walk up there, get to the room, open the window and shoot somebody across the way. It's not like that. It's very, very, very unlikely that the bullet sh by any, well, we know where the shot came from. It came from the yard below there. So when you see the people in the picture pointing over in that direction, they say, oh, they, they were pointing to the window. No, they were pointing in the direction the shot came from. And that included the yard below the window where we are quite certain the real shot was fired, but it's. It's great because when you look at that room, all of a sudden it's like, oh, this doesn't really make sense. And there's a line in the, the podcast too, where the, the actual gun with the sniper has a very difficult time, just even like the size of it, even getting through the window at that yeah. time. Yeah. Oh, uh, well, that's the other thing is that the window was open, but just a couple of inches. We know that from photographs, et cetera. Well, the, the, the rifle has a whole thing and then base and a scope on it and the whole scope would be blocked by the the lower sill of the window it's just you know and no one questions this it's, i mean once you have that's the beauty of the guilty plea is that oh 
He said he did it. So why do we care? No one looks at any of the evidence. No one looks into the case because the guy confessed and he was forced into the confession, but that's the beauty of the confession. That's why they wanted it. That's why they paid for it, you know, because then that just ends the conversation. And a lot of people may be asking, well, you know, he did confess. <laughs> why was the King family then trying to challenge his confession and conviction? If, if he said he did it, then why does the King family not believe it? And you bring in attorney Art, G Art Haynes Jr. and his father were the first people to represent James Earl Ray at the time when he said he didn't kill King. And they prepare for trial. They discover there's serious problems with the state's evidence and that it's a slam dunk that he's going to get off. And then Ray says, you know, I'm not going to go with you anymore. I'm going to go with this guy, Percy Foreman. Could you talk a bit about who this scoundrel was? Oh, God. You know, yeah, Percy Foreman was a, a big time celebrity in Cherney. Really self-made man, put himself through law school. He really smart. He knew how to talk to juries in a way that they like to be talked to. And he was a total crudhead sham thief, but virtually everything he ever said about the MLK crime and James O'Reilly Ray was a lie. He, it was, it's almost like Trump can't, you can't say, you can't tell a straight story. There's got to be a lie involved in it somewhere. Percy Foreman was famous at that point. He had defended any number of rich celebrities in, in, on murder charges or you know, not, if not celebrities, well-known people or, and gotten a lot of them off. In fact, most of them off. And again, it was because he had this manner that the juries just, just loved to watch him work. And, and he shows up on the weekend before the trial is to begin. And he's allowed into James O'Ray's cell and, uh, which is, was against the law that, and, and Ray's attorneys would have to give permission for that to happen but they were, and he spends that weekend sweet talking James O'Reilly. Ray. Oh, these guys, you know, Ray had a few dissatisfactions with his first lawyers, although they treated him very well, but he wanted to testify. And they said to him, we can't guarantee that, that we're going to let you testify because there's a lot of dangers when, when a defendant takes the stand, especially a defendant with a criminal history, because you get up on the stand. And they can take you through every crime you've committed and every, everything you've ever done. And by the time they're done with you, that's all the jury will think about. And you're just this criminal and, you know, you're going to get what you deserve. And so, you know, you got to let us put this thing on, you know, you'll take the stand if we feel the case is in such a position that you need to, but we can't guarantee you that you're going to. Well, he was, Ray was put off by this. And Percy Foreman said, well, these, oh, oh, and there was also a matter of contracts for publishing rights and stuff like that, and, and which is how they were financing the defense. I mean, Haynes and father weren't poor, but they weren't exactly rich either. And they needed to get the money from somewhere. So Percy Foreman comes and says, I'm so rich. I don't need publishing rights. And I know what to do with these guys. These guys are going to, and he bad mouths them. And influences raise. I've gotten so many people off. You know, this this is going to be the easiest case I ever ever argued. Just a, so he got Ray to change his mind, and he let the uh, the Haynes father and son go, and took on Percy Foreman, who then did first of all took on took over the publishing rights that Haynes had. So he lied about that, and then he he did nothing not a thing investigating. He did no preparation. He just disappeared for a month or two and then showed up and said, oh, gee, you're going to have to plead guilty. I can't defend you and I won't defend you and blah, 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 blah. And finally, and then the judge said, well, you can't change attorneys at this point. You've done it one time already. And if you, if you fire this guy, we're just going to put on a public defender and he's going to have to go to trial right now anyway. So he had no options. And so then what the deal was, was that he would plead guilty, but uh, Percy Foreman would give him something like $500 to go hire another attorney and overturn the plea. And so he did, he, he pled guilty. And three days later, he, he wrote to judge battle asking him to overturn the plea. He wanted to go to a real trial. 
a battle was going to rule on that and then die suddenly at his desk. Bill Pepper said that he was told that he, he actually collapsed. The document he was going to sign was actually on the desk that he collapsed on. I don't know if that's true or not, but it, it's, it sounds true to me. But in any case, Judge Battle dies, and there are people who think that it wasn't, it wasn't an accident that he died. They really, really, really didn't want a trial. And, yeah. uh, you know, because if a trial comes, you don't know what's going to happen. You don't know what There's witnesses discovery. are going to show up. <laughs> yes. So Battle dies, and the next judge that takes his place, you know, says, no, you're not getting a trial. And that's the end of it. But, you know, the, the whole beauty of the guilty plea is that it ends the conversation in the public mind. And he didn't plead guilty. He, as I understand the podcast, is that Percy Foreman was saying, look, some of the people that, you know, got you this Mustang and you that were involved with the assassination, even if you were involved with it, you are now guilty of the conspiracy to kill King, which is the same as pulling the trigger. And they're going to fry you for that. So you got to plead guilty, even though he's then said right afterwards, he's like, I never shot this guy, you know, like I was with some of these people that I don't know who exactly they were, but yeah. Yeah. It's called, it's called felony murder. If you commit a felony with, with someone, and even though it's not part of the plan, they, they shoot the, the, the clerk of the store you're robbing and he, and he dies. Well, you're, you're on for that murder. And so that's, that's something else that Foreman was trying to, to do with James O'Reilly, but of course we have a witness at the end of the podcast who comes on and tells us what the real deal with Percy Foreman was and that he was paid $125,000 if he could get in and get ready to plead guilty, which is what he did and what he was paid to do. And this guy actually carried the satchel with the $125,000 down to, to Foreman's office and, and handed it to him. I mean, that's incredible that H. we have H. that on H. personal guy. Yeah. And that at the, at the end of the podcast, it, it's kind of like, where are you going with this? Where are you going with this? And it, and you just tie it in so perfectly. Uh, just it, it's, it's open and shut, but let, let's go a little bit further in Percy Foreman also purges him. him he, he purges himself, perjures himself during the house assassination, house select committee on assassinations, where they're asking him about writing this look magazine article, I believe. And he's saying, well, and he just contradicts himself that he never wrote it <laughs> after yeah. he said he wrote it. Right. The man lies at, at every opportunity. There's just, you know, he's, he's, he, after the trial, he went out on the street and the, they were all asking him questions. And he said, I saved this young man's life. This is why I came on to the case to save this young man's life. Well, actually, no, they already had a plea deal offered. If they wanted to do a plea deal, uh, Art Hayes, the original attorney said, Oh, we could have gotten a plea deal like that, that we were offered a better one than the one he, he took. So, and Ray didn't want a plea deal. Ray wanted to go to trial. And, and Foreman said, oh, that was always the plan. I came on and I promised him I'd get his life spared and we'd do a plea deal. That's, that's an enormous lie. That was always the plan, he said. No, it wasn't. Yeah. And you, in episode five, Jim's Grill, which I didn't know about any of this, you know, uh, just... The circumstantial evidence that we just talked about is I, I had some familiarity with some of it before before the podcast, minus Percy Foreman and and just the cutting the bushes and just some very questionable things that I I've always kind of questioned. And and then of course the trials and everything else. But the Jim's grill is right near the Lorraine Motel. And this guy, Lloyd Jowers, is her the boss of a waitress named Betty Spates. And she sees him carrying the gun that was used to kill King through the back door and package it up. And for the rest of her life, she's, she's living with, with this experience as a witness. Yeah. Could you, could you talk a bit about like the, the Betty Spates and, and Lloyd Jowers side of it? It just keeps getting I, more absurd. I, I love Betty Spates. I love Betty Spates. She was 16 years old. A young black woman working for Lloyd Jowers at this at this greasy spoon where her sister Bobby also worked, and uh, you know as as you said, I mean it's such a crazy story. But and she and Jowers were having an a, a affair, and all kinds of crazy things were happening that day. But at one point, she walks into the kitchen, and 
the door to the kitchen was closed, which she thought was odd that she walks into the kitchen and Jowers isn't there, but the back door is open. And that's odd. The back door was usually closed. And then she hears what she recognizes as a shot. Later, she heard some bang noise. And then her, her employer or her lover, Jowers, comes running through the door carrying this rifle, which she then hides and says to, and sees Betty and said, Betty, you'd never do anything to hurt me, would you? And she said, no, Lloyd, I, I wouldn't. And, and she lives with us for years. She, and then finally, you know, Bill Pepper talked to her in, in around 1990 or, or a little a- after that. And she finally tells Bill the story of what she saw. And, and it just, it's, it, it, it's crazy. But then Lloyd Jowers approaching death, then sits down in a, a, a motel room with Dexter King and Ambassador Andy Young and Pepper and confesses to them that, in fact, he did bring the, the murder weapon in and hide it in his store. Jower's story to, to them and to us is filled with lies, but it's basically true. It's, you know, it's, he, he said one of the big, his big lies was he didn't know King was to be killed. Well, come on. Yes, you did. You know, he said, oh, I was told to be at the back door at six o'clock and somebody was going to hand me something. No, that's not what happened. You were out there with the other guys and your job was to bring the rifle in and make it disappear. So, so, and then, then at one point he did identify one of the people out there with him who was a police sharpshooter, Earl, oh God, begun his last name. And, uh, and that, that man was also identified by a couple other witnesses we have as being involved. But the shooter, the, that was the spotter. He was, Jowers was the guy that was make the gun disappear. Okay. I'm going to say Caldwell, and that's wrong, was the spotter. But the shooter, he, he just wouldn't identify the shooter. And then when he finally did, he identified the shooter as some black guy that hadn't been seen for 15, 20 years. And Bill Pepper got this guy's identity and found him in Florida living in a homeless shelter. And he said, you know, Lloyd Jowers just said you killed King, you know, and he's, he's just like, no way. And, and looking at this guy, it was, it was just so clear that it was just, and so Pepper says, well, why do you think Jowers would say that? And what this guy said was, I think he thought I was dead. And so it would just be a safe thing to say. So Jowers doesn't really name the shooter, but we think. We, we think we know who the shooter is because of a, a couple other witnesses we have. Clark, uh, I think is his name. Thank you. Yeah. That's, that's good. I was going to say Earl Campbell, Earl Caldwell, Earl Clark. Yes. Good for you. You're going to get an A on your final. <laughs> uh, but so, yeah, I mean, this all happened out in the yard. It didn't happen up in the bathroom. And, and, and if you think like if you're going to be doing one of these operations that you have any sniper team has the spotter, the shooter, and then something that is the getaway, which is essentially, in this case, taking the evidence out of the hand of the shooter to then blend in with the car or blend in with the crowd. And there, I, there's a few more points I, I just kind of want to kind of keep going through a little bit more on the petition by Bill Pepper to reopen the case against James Earl Ray. And it lands in the courtroom of Judge Joe Brown, who's a firearms expert. And He's African-American and he, he opens it up and then all this craziness happens with finding the bullet, trying to recreate the shot, and then the bullet is shattered in pieces. And then the, he's a judge with his, his own parking space with the name on it. And there are people, F, there's some federal agents that are planting cocaine in his car. And they said, oops, sorry, mistake. Even though like, why are federal agents planting cocaine in anyone's car? It, it, it's just, it, it just keeps going on and on. And you, you talk about, you talk about, I, I mean, you, you go through it and something, the, the shooting, the, the, the two shooters of, of Strausser, this guy, Frank Strausser, is apparently the guy who most likely pulled the trigger, it, it looks like. And Lenny Curtis, he works at the police rifle range, and this is in episode 11. And Frank Strausser is, is shooting all day on this new, <laughs> this new rifle. And special actually, baby. What's that? The special baby is what they call the rifle, the special baby. It just showed up two days before. 
Yeah. And Go ahead. It, it's yeah. It, and this guy, this guy, Lee, Lenny Curtis, a black man as well, is calling to try to warn King that he, he's on to them, that this is this is going down. And this is there's just all this like foresight before it happens where people and, and he, he held that witness to himself that what he witnessed for for most of his life. But he also came out. But can you talk about who Lenny Curtis was working at the, the police rifle range? Yeah, that's that's an amazing story in in a lot of ways because you know he's working at the rifle range and he hears a lot of stuff and, and then you're going to hear a lot of stuff that you know that King guy King but it, it gets a little personal you know he hears this guy Strausser and Earl Clark you know somebody's got to kill King you know but 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 the day of this oh a couple of days before the assassination this new this new fancy rifle shows up and it was either Strausser or Clark shows it to Lenny Curtis and said. What do you think about this, this rifle here, a lady? And he says, oh, it's a rifle like any other rifle. I said, no, this is a special baby. This, this rifle is special. Sick. And, you know, he's not really sure what they're talking about. But then the next, the day that Strausser shows up in the morning and starts fire, taking that rifle and just firing it, firing it, firing it all morning, he's all of a sudden, he feels that he knows what's going to happen. And then he sees Strausser come out of the basement with a rifle and he's dressed up like a, a, a fireman and he's got his hair all sort of different. And he, and he drives away in a fire, a, a friend of his fireman's car and which if he was going down t- to park somewhere, the firehouse there might have been the perfect place for him because that car would have been recognizable to him. And he was dressed like a fireman. In any case, he's. Lenny Curtis is certain that feels that it, this is all going to go, go towards the assassination of King. And he tries to call this minister and he can't get through. And basically that's all the money he has is for one phone call. And so he's, he, he walks home by the time he gets home, he hears that King has been killed. And the thing is, Strausser suspects that Lenny, Lenny suspects him. He, he, cause he knows he's seen him. He's just, and Strausser at one point asked Lenny Curtis to go downtown and pick up the paychecks for the guys. Strausser has never invited Lenny Curtis to go anywhere with him. And Curtis is, is really afraid, but he's also afraid to say no, because that would somehow. So he, he takes a shot. And, uh, but part of him is thinking that it, he's just going to be taken somewhere and killed. And, and uh, so they go town, town, and then take a turn away from the, the office where they're going to pick up the paychecks. They drive to a wooded place and now as far as beating like crazy. And Strausser turns to Lenny and says, you know, what do you think about that murder of King? And Lenny says, man, th- that guy Ray did it. Everybody knows that that guy Ray did it. And, you know, uh, Curtis is saying, like, that's not what I thought, but I knew what I had to say. And then Strausser says to him, Lenny, you must, you just be real careful now. And it's left at that. He's not shot. Although there are two incidences where Lenny Curtis feels that Strausser was in fact trying to kill him. But the part of the story that I, that I like is that Pepper finds out from a friend of Curtis's that he has a story to tell and Pepper gets a hold of Curtis and he said, would you please tell us your story? It's really important. And Curtis has been afraid all his life. And he finally agrees on two conditions. One, that Martin, the oldest son of King, that Martin King III be there when he tells everything he knows. And the other is that this, it can all be taped on video and audio but it can never be released to anyone until after he's died. Now think about that. That's, that's, you know, that says something about how the fear that he still feels and also about the truth of what he's talking about. So Pepper agrees and he keeps his agreement, but finally, finally he dies. Lenny Curtis dies and our listeners get to hear what Lenny Curtis had to tell Bill Pepper and Martin King III on that day, they all got together and recorded that. It's, it's quite something. Yeah. It's an incredible, incredible interview. A few more questions before we, I, I want to talk about a few things outside of the MLK tapes, but 
you all you also put together a witness, John McFerrin, and this Dixie Mafia and the Ku Klux Klan and the Masonic Order. And this guy is born and bred in Memphis. Uh, and his father was very involved with people like Clyde Tolson, who was um, the partner of J. Edgar Hoover and came to Memphis quite uh, and on numerous occasions. And just to, it, it just kind of opens the window into this world of this guy and, and how they ran Memphis at that time. And can you talk, talk a bit about just like that, what was Memphis in the 1960s uh, that King is going to organize these sanitation workers. And this is the type of mafia police state that they're, they're facing. Yeah. I mean, that, that witness, Ronnie Lee Atkins is, is he came up from Texas with his lawyer, Robert Tolan and sat down with Bill Pepper and for seven hours seven hours spoke about the, the, the scene of the Dixie Mafia and Clyde Tolson and how things were run in Memphis and, and it, how his entire family was complicit in the murder of Martin Luther King. It's, it's extraordinary. His older brother, his father, who was dead finally when King was killed, but had been involved in the planning. And his mother was also involved. I mean, seven hours of this guy just talking and, and it's so engaging. The stories he tells are so funny. And, and I mean, yes, they're funny. It's, it's, but it's also, yes, there was, there was the real mafia, the, the Italian mafia. And then there was the Dixie mafia who were the, who were the criminals who weren't Italian. And they had both of these things going on and they didn't really fight amongst themselves. They kind of left each other alone. And then when they they share in various operations and each take a cut and stuff. But and you know, when they were by themselves. They they curse these guys, the other guys out. You know the the, the wops and all this stuff. But you know when there was something to be money to be made, they they'd go in on it together. And so yeah, and the and the the police department was extraordinarily corrupt. And then the guy who took the police department over just six months before King was killed was you know, a former FBI agent who basically, you know, worked with in Hoover's office for seven years. So this is now the FBI is now essentially running the Memphis police. It's, it's yeah. quite a mix. Yeah. And, and, and it, it wasn't a nice, it wasn't a nice place to be. It's particularly if you were, you were black because the, it, you know, the, not letting the, the sanitation workers form a union or give them a living wage. And that was like keeping them in this, this, and finally they, when they went on strike, they, they, they paraded through Memphis with signs saying, I am a man. And, and they would not have, they, they finally did win the, the right to unionize, but only after King was killed and they, they realized they had to do something or, the, but it was, yes, it was not a nice place. Yeah, and it's just wild and, and. Correction, yeah, not John McFerrin, but Ronnie Lee Ad Adkins. But even the idea of the planning that they were trying to create race riots to get King to come, just just all of this it, conspiracy to to bring this man to Memphis. And, and you lay it out so clearly with your team. And it's such an amazing and important documentary that everyone should listen to. And uh, I do want to talk a bit about the production uh, with working with Tenderfoot TV and iHeartMedia, the fact that they picked it up. And I, I, a little side note, a lot of the commercials that come into it is better, uh, better help <laughs> online therapy to help mental health. I think you were reading some of those advertisements and I think like it's almost you hear this and as people are actually trying to process it, it's kind of funny to, to hear that advertisement at least. But how how do like for someone who's trying to create documentaries on such an explosive topic, could you just ex uh, talk a little bit more? And you mentioned it at the beginning about working with Tenderfoot TV and, and how this came together. Well, from one thing, oh, oh, Donald Albright and, and his, his sister, Jamie are, are, are black. So that, and, and from Atlanta and Tenderfoot TV is located in, in Atlanta. And so, you know, which, which is where the, the King churches. And, and so I, they had a feeling for this and, and a, it, there was a deeper meaning for them in this than there were to other podcast companies that I had approached that, you know, 
this was just, I, mean, I was just some guy, but it, it mattered to them in a way that was meaningful to me. And, you know, when we got together, you know, I, I just, I like, I like the whole attitude and, and, you know, it just, it, it, yeah. And the whole, I don't know how to describe it, but, and, and, you know, we, we very seldom saw each other in person after we had made the deal. I was up in New York state and they were down in, in Atlanta and we each, we all had our different areas and things that we really needed to do. And, and, you know, and they, they, they questioned every episode that we put together was very question, you know, do, is this really true? And how do we know this? And, and all that. So we held ourselves to a pretty high standard and I ended up set to, to record all this. I had a set up recording studio in the house, but I couldn't find a room that didn't have some weird echo in it. So finally it, in, there was a closed closet that we set up the whole, the whole apparatus, the microphones and then all the gizmos and stuff like that. And we, my wife called it the French resistance because <laughs> we were here, you know, broadcasting out and, and, you know, from this, this little thing in a closet, but they were terrific. They were just terrific. And I, and I got, I miss it now, you know, we used to get together every week and then talk you know, sometimes in between the weeks and, you know, I, it, I, I, I do, I do miss it, the camaraderie of it all. And, you know, we won, we ended up winning a Webby and uh, that was a big deal. And we got to all see each other in New York at this really fancy, you know, dinner down on wall street and, you know, so that was an awful lot of fun to get that kind of recognition. Yeah. yeah it, it's, you, it's an incredible historical mission and, and a lot of work. And I, I know a lot of resources went into it from, from such a high quality production as well. So personally, how, how do you stay sane when people are ignorant or lack curiosity or just are afraid to go there because it would shatter their entire world? How do you stay sane and, and how do you, what advice would you give to people who may be listening to the, this for the first time and it may shatter their world and how to, how to keep hope and keep love? <laughs> A lot of questions uh, there. You know, I. I think today, I mean, I mean, that was essentially the murders of John Kennedy, Robert Kennedy, Martin Luther King, and, you know, Malcolm X and, and even the shooting of George Wallace. I mean, that was, that was a coup d'etat in this country. It, it really was. I mean, no, nothing short of that. And that's extraordinary that that could happen. And you have the entire apparatus of the government and basically the entire news apparatus rush in and defend this, this coup. It's, it, you know, when you realize that's happened, it's, it's, it's something it, it's, it's rather extraordinary and, and depressing. And, uh, you know, we're watching something not similar because it's being done in a whole different way, but something as threatening as that even more threatening, I, I feel, but I, I guess to a certain extent now I'm, I'm less worried about the, that coup d'etat, which has come and gone and. They don't, they don't murder authors anymore. So I'm totally grateful for that. You know, it, it's, uh, you know, they, they could have gotten me any, any old time, but, oh, I don't, it's, it's, it's a matter of history now. It's, it's, you know, and, and what I'm glad about with the podcast is those voices, it's not in a book somewhere that's just going to sit in a library and nobody's going to read it, you know, the kind of thing. It's those voices are up in the ether and they will remain there until the, the earth falls into the sun. And so anybody going forward who wants to write something about the murder of Martin Luther King is going to have to deal with those people, those voices, those witnesses that we gathered there. You, you will not be able to go around it and not deal with it. And, you know, they try to, to somehow over the years say, oh, well, Betty Spates was trying to make a movie. Well, no, she wasn't, you know, but for every, every witness that steps forward, they have some reason why, you know, we shouldn't believe them, but you take this whole thing together and you realize that, no, they were the ones telling the lies. And, you know, I, I don't, it's, it's, de it's depressing, but I, I think at this point we have things just as serious on our plates now than, than we did back then.
And and that's th this idea of current history. I love this idea of current history where y you connect the past is still working today and we need to deal with the past to be able to to move forward with the future. We're going to be pulled in, in many different directions. So if there is a coup d'etat that has never been dealt with and we need a truth and reckoning and reconciliation. So there needs to be a reckoning as well where there needs to be some accountability held and getting more and more people to understand that when labor, anti-war and civil rights all came together, that was the great danger for actually taking back power from the, these ruling class criminal mafia <laughs> network of, of folks. So where can people learn more about your work, Bill? Well, you know, if, if you want to, you want to know more about the, 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 the murder of Robert Kennedy, you can read shadow play. I'm proud of that book. And I, I think it's very convincing that that murder did not take place the way we were all told. And it's, it's extraordinary to me that even the book was re released in 2018 on the 50th anniversary and the New York times refused to review it again. And it, you know, it's. If they had some problem with it, you know, I thought, oh, this guy Claybury is off the wall. It's just like, it, well, if you have a problem with it, say it in the review. That's what reviews are for. But to not review it on, on, on a carefully written book on a, a matter of national importance, what the hell was that? You know, and uh, shame on them, shame on them. And, you know, to a certain extent, it's been the complicity of the, the news organizations in this country that they would turn their backs on this and the whole idea, oh, you're a conspiracy theorist. Really? I mean, it was a very clever, you know, words to come up with because it makes you sound like you're up in an attic somewhere. So I'm spinning little circles in the air and thinking of, you know, some theories. No, there, you're there's, doc there's documentary evidence, I believe, that 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 term came out from CIA messaging yeah. after the Kennedy assassination around the Warren Commission that people weren't swallowing. Yeah. I mean, you know, you, you go back to John Kennedy and he's shot in Dallas and, you know, supposedly, does, does anybody know why Lee Harvey Oswald supposedly killed Kennedy? Is there, is there an official explanation that you know of? Other than him calling himself a patsy and being heavily involved with intelligence agencies. Right. <laughs> no. So he's involved in, I mean. And Which is covered up. You know, there, 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 is no, there is no tape of his interrogation and no transcript of his interrogation. Now, what crimes do you know of, serious crimes you know of, that they interrogate somebody for a day and a half and keep no record of? What does that say? And you know what it says because he's, they're, they're asking questions and he's saying, well, call E. Howard Hunt. He knows who I am. You know, uh, he, and and they're saying, "Oh my God!" You know, we what are we going to do with this? And you can imagine the phone calls going. We got this guy, and he's saying pretty incredible things. Well, just you just hold him there. We'll figure something out. And uh, all of a sudden, this guy shows up, and while he's in custody at, at the police station, uh, Jack Ruby shows up and shoots Lee Harvey Oswald. Do you know why Jack Ruby said that he shot Oswald? Other than he wanted think, to spare Jackie Kennedy the pain of a trial. What a considerate insane. fellow that guy was. What insane. a really considerate fellow. Well, you know, Oswald needed to die. He was supposed to die the day that Kennedy was shot. And somehow they captured him and he captured him alive. And now what are they going to do with it? And because he, you know, he had false defector to Russia and, you know, false Cuban sympathizer and all he this stuff. He got picked up at the airport when he came back by, I think, yeah. a FBI or CIA agent and was in New Orleans at a at a place that was a known FBI, CIA kind of headquarters. Yeah, yeah. Campbell Street. That, that, Re no, it's... Replay it's, of Cuba. It, it, yeah, it's, it's, it's offensive for anyone with a half of a concentration to look at this for just a little bit. It's offensive how how bad the, the story goes. Yeah, it, you know, it's... It, Make it, us it's believe like, it. If, you know, if you live in New York City and you come home one day and your apartment's been burglarized and the moment you walk in the door, you know, that's happened because all the shit is all over the place in the underwear and, you know, it's thrown. Well, that's, that's, the, that's the John Kennedy assassination. You know, you just start looking at the evidence and it's everywhere that this was a conspiracy everywhere. And yet 
we have the Lauren Commission report and the da 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 and the complicity of the news organizations, and everybody's pretending that this didn't happen. Well, um, quite amazing actually yeah. to live through that, and um, and to live amongst our our peers and fellow citizens that are lulled to sleep or in hip, hypnotized by the media or something else, or just too scared to pull the thread, or just too uncaring about the reality we live in to try to find the truth. Yeah. Yeah. It is. <laughs> it's a little discouraging uh, at my, at my age, I, I've stopped worrying about things I, I can't can control, but I'm, I'm, I'm happy. I got a chance to throw a couple stones back at these guys. So that's what we've done. Well, Bill, thank you again for your time. And the MLK tapes is just an incredible crime podcast. Everyone's interested in listening to crime podcasts these days. Everyone should take a look at the MLK tapes. And thanks for putting this historical record together with your team. And you've done a service for all Americans interested in taking a closer look <laughs> at the history of our country. And no. I, I just want to, in closing, let's remember what King was fighting for and why he was murdered. There was a poor people's campaign sought to address poverty through income and housing for where everyone was going to be able to get a job and everyone was going to be able to be housed. Mm -hmm. the, and it was about uniting the races, not dividing the races. It was trying to get an economic bill of rights that was first mentioned under FDR. And it was an anti-poverty package that we still need today. And these are the people that we are going to be in the way. So the fight remains. But Bill Kleber, thank you so much for your time. Evan, thank, thank you. A, a terrific interview. You're really up on this stuff. And it, it was really a pleasure to, to be speaking with you today. Ooh.